another feature of Russian traditional society was orthodoxy. Orthodoxy refers to the established church in imperial Russia. Established churches have the support of the state and support the state. It is the legal state religion in a country. The Orthodox Church rested upon spiritualism, the idea that non-corporal beings impacted and directed humanity and everything in nature from natural occurrences, earthquakes, tidal waves, hurricanes, storms, to placing czars on the throne. One of the unique features of Russian society was the prevalence or the continuation of superstitions and pagan traditions like stares, uh, mystical men who traveled the countryside and offered healing, uh, fertility, any of the life's ailments or troubles could be treated by or helped by consulting one of these mystical men who were outside of Russian official churches, but were tolerated because they were part of the folk religion and folk spirituality in the Russian empire. Christianity, though, was the was the official religion of the state, tracing its heritage back to St. Vladimir, who brought Christianity to the Rus from the Byzantine Empire in 989, which meant that Russian Christianity was Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity refers to a type of Christianity that traces its heritage back to the Emperor Constantine, back to the Council of Nicaea. It is a Trinitarian faith that believes there are three persons in one God. It is a sacramental faith that people uh, eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus. It is an apostolic faith that the church is led by bishops. One of the distinguishing features of the Orthodox churches, though, is Caesar Papism that instead of having a separate pope, the Caesar, the emperor, is the head of the church, that these two institutions are one. Unlike the West, the Byzantine Empire, neither the Byzantine Empire nor the Russian Empire had to compete with a separate church. The emperor controlled the church by controlling the bishops. In the West, the pope controlled the bishops. This created tensions between political leaders in the West and churches. That political tension didn't exist because the church and the state were all under one leader. One of the things that then made this possible was the idea of equality among bishops. This idea was one of the dividing factors between the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. Greek Orthodox bishops refused to submit to the authority of the Bishop of Rome. Greek Orthodox bishops saw themselves as co-equals. There were patriarchs, there were metropolitans who were more important, but each of them believed that they had equality. In, in this case, they were equally submissive to the state. When the Romanov dynasty emerges in Moscow, they elevate the patriarch of Moscow as the uh, most prestigious position among bishops, but he is just first among equals. He's using this, this, this similar idea that comes out that the patri patriarch of Constantinople was first among equals under the Byzantine Empire. Theologically, there was a slight difference with Roman Catholicism, even though they were Trinitarians. They 
held to the idea of the subordination of the son with this, with the exclusion from the Nicene Creed of filio eque, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, filio eque, and the Son, filio, Son, que, and. The Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox after it followed the older formulation that simply said the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father. Long story short, this causes a, a, eventually a schism and a break along with the overly quality of bishops between the Bishop of Rome and the Eastern Orthodox churches. That tradition then gets passed up through St. Vladimir into the Russian Empire. They also uh, reject this idea of purgatory. This was big in medieval Catholicism. It was central to the split between Catholicism and Protestantism that there is this holding place, this place there where individuals who did not fulfill all their penance had to continue to have a physical punishment before they entered into heaven. Uh, the, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church did not entertain this notion. It was, it was not part of scripture and it was part of a cultural tradition that developed in the West. And so the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox Church did not share in this uh, belief. There were some small minor breaks in Russian Orthodox faith. Uh, there were some things that were not tolerated among bishops. And one of those breaks comes with this idea of old believers. They were a distinct minority, but and they, they were spread out around the empire. Emperors tried to crush them, but they continued on into the 19th century. Old believers rejected the reforms of the Patriarch of Moscow, Nikon. Uh, Nikon had the support of the, uh, of, of the Tsar, and he set about aligning Russian Orthodox language and practices with Greek Orthodox language and practices. In an Orthodox church, they're more likely to, they do use the vernacular. So the Greek Orthodox church used Greek, not Latin. That was the Roman Catholic. Roman Catholics used Latin. When the church moved into Moscow or to, to, to Russian areas, they used Russian language or they used the Ukrainian language. And they used whatever the local Vulgate was. There was no fixation on using a church language at this time. When Nikon started, quote, investigating the language used in prayer and ritual in the Russian Orthodox Church, Nikon found that there were some small technical dif differences between them and he wanted to align the, the, the language and rituals in the Russian Orthodox Church more closely with the Greek Orthodox Church to create better cohesion. But we have to remember in a spiritual, from a spiritual point of view, uh, there are power in rituals, right? These words are not simply words. Words have the ability to impact the behavior of spirits. And so the words are the symbols and the signs that people use <sighs> impact what happens in the world, right? What is God, how is God gonna respond? God responds to the proper language. So they're not just words, right? If I told you to, to, to go to hell, right? That's an insult. It, but in a pre-modern traditional word point, if you told someone to go to hell, that's a curse, right? That's a real curse word. You are cursing them. You want something bad to happen to them. We also have good words, right? You say blessings. And when someone sneezes, you bless you. That has the power to heal them. They're not just words. Words have power. So, for example, the spelling of Jesus. Uh, 
we have the Cyrillic alphabet on one side and then the, the Latin alphabet on the, in, in brackets. Do you add an extra letter in the spelling of Jesus when you have a Bible or you have, say, a prayer? Do we know who's talking about? From, from my point of view, it doesn't make a, a, a bit of difference. But if you're, quote, a believer and someone starts spelling Jesus differently, right, that's central to Christianity, then the new spelling becomes an abomination. The sign of the cross, the old way to the sign of the cross was to take the, the two, the ring finger and the pinky finger and touch it to the thumb. And this would then be how to perform a sign of the cross. On the other hand, when literally when Nikon proposed to change, he wanted to change it so that there were the thumb touch the index and the middle finger instead. This had a symbolic impact because the, the two fingers, right, either way represents the dual nature of Jesus, both as divine and human. And then the three fingers together represents the Trinity. And so depending upon how you formulate the figure, fingers, it's how, what do you think about the nature of God and reminding yourself when you make the sign of the cross and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that has power of being a blessing over you and if you have it over people. So this re- manipulating of fingers during this particular sign, the old believers rejected it and said, this is something newfangled. But it, it, once again, it was in line with what the Greek Orthodox were doing. One of the things that made this more difficult for Nikon was a sixth century icon that has Jesus as an icon, right? Obviously, it's not a picture of Jesus, but it's a representation of Jesus. And if you look at the way he's holding his fingers, it, it seems to correspond with tradition. In other words, Nikon was breaking with tradition, and that was bad. And so the old believers resisted this change because all of it impacted salvation. Their ultimate goal was not to have power on this earth, but their ultimate goal was to get to eternal life. And if people like Nikon were teaching things that were contrary to the teachings of Jesus, then individuals who follow Nikon risk damnation. But Nikon had the power of the state uh, behind him. And so the state condemned that the old believers as heretics and moved on with the, the Nikonian reforms. This had a direct impact on the way old believers worshiped. So for example, here's a floor plan that shows the nave of a church, the choir, that's where people sang, an iconostasis, which is a, an image of icons or, or a, a group of images called icons on a wall that was between the choir and the altar. So in a Russian Orthodox and Greek Orthodox church, the priest will walk through the iconostasis, all the icons are on the wall, go back to the altar, uh, consecrate the bread and the wine, then come back through the iconostasis to share it with the con congregation. When the state condemned Old believers, old believers lost access to priests. And so old believers who wanted to continue to worship redesigned their church where they still have a nave, they still have a choir, they still have an kind of case a kind of stasis, but the altar goes away because they don't have access to the Eucharist. They don't have access to the bread and the, the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. And so instead they have this quasi-altar that holds the gospel and they have gospel readings, which is the word of God, instead of having an actual sacramental ceremony. 
these old believers were a distinct minority. They were spread out in communities across the Russian Empire. And it's not until Catherine the Great tolerated them in the end of the 18th century that they were able to actually worship publicly and freely. Uh, they weren't authorized in the sense of being a recognized part of the established church, but they were tolerated as a distinct religious minority. Much bigger as a problem and a set of distinct beliefs were minorities on the periphery. Now, uh, I've taken this religions map of Europe. Uh, obviously, it's an early 20th century, 19th century, uh, late 19th century map that shows the basic religious breakdown of Europe with the blue areas remaining Roman Catholic, the pink areas are Protestant, uh, the green areas are Greek Orthodox, or in this case, Russian Orthodox, the tan or peachy areas are Islam. The red line is a rough approximation of the extent of the Russian Empire in 1815. And you'll see that on the periphery, right, at the boundary, at that red boundary, were religious minorities. That the people who were Rus, Russian, whether either Great Russians from Moscow, and that's what they call themselves, they call themselves Great Russians, or Bielo Russians, White Russians, or Ukrainians and what the Russians called Little Russians, all of them shared a Greek Orthodox background. And only on the peripheries of the empire, after, when, when the Russians, the, the, the Romanovs started conquering on the periphery, did they bring in large religious minorities. So for example, uh, two big Roman Catholic areas that came in at the end of the 18th century were both the Poles and the Lithuanians. They had their leader, which was the Pope. Now, this creates a problem in the 19th century as Russian Orthodox leaders uh, uh, want to create uniformity. And so it creates a resistance movement. There are also significant numbers of Protestants on the periphery. The, in Finland, in Estonia, Latvia, Latvia, those regions had uh, Lutherans predominantly. Lutherans, by and large, accept that there's an a, a Episcopal church. Lutherans, by and large, accept that they have a sacramental church, but they do not recognize the authority of the emperor, the czar, as the head of their church. This also creates tension. Last but not least, or in the eastern parts of the empire, in the non-European parts of the empire, the, as the czar expanded their role, they brought into uh, on the periphery, the southern border, large number of Islamic uh, believers where they rejected the divinity of Jesus. They accepted the prophecy of Abraham that there is only one God, but they certainly did not hold to a idea that there was a trinity, that there, was, that there were sacraments. So while they did worship the same one God, they did not recognize the God of the Tsar. This also then will create tensions going into the 19th century. The czar in the 19th century was the head of the church. The czar argued that he had his authority because God placed him on the throne. That was the God of the Russian Orthodox Church. If he were to survive, he needed the favor of God. 